runs in streaks. Good evening. Welcome to the Arizona Deliverance Center. Welcome to HardcoreChristianity.com. Welcome, YouTubers. Tonight's seminar. Rick and Lisa. Uh, you made it. All right. Rick and Lisa are here. We can go ahead and start. <laughs> Out of towners. Pastor Francis has got a new book on sale. It's in the bookstore. Uh, got another note for you here. Uh, some of the neighbors here are complaining about us. They want to go to the city and all this other stuff. Uh, they don't like us parking on that side of the street. You know. So I said, hey, you know, it's legal to park, you know, in the street. And so anyway, they're, they're griping about it. So if you think of it, well, we got obviously parking here, and then we got a whole parking lot next door there at the women's healing house. There's plenty of parking over there. You know, I told them that I would uh, mention it to you and recommend it because I don't like to get in any hassles with anybody. So, yeah, you know, this is not this is not fall in the category of persecution. <laughs> This falls in the category of a, an annoyance. Yeah. If you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Welcome to the seminar. Got a good one for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to hit some controversial areas tonight, so when I get to them, I'm going to pre-qualify it by saying that I'm not 100% sure I'm correct. So if I say I'm not 100% sure I'm correct, that means you're not allowed to get mad at me. <laughs> and you're not allowed to send me a nasty email because I qualified it. That's how you get out of stuff. I've been married a few times. Now here's the next seminar. Tonight's the seminar. The next one's July 26. This is the fun part of the evening, the announcements. All of my teachings, over 400 of them, plus Rick and the rest of the crew, all on youtube.com slash houseofhealingaz. And we broadcast there live tonight. And uh, <clears throat> if you wanted to help our ministry, you could switch from Google to Good Search. And if you put it in our charity name, they'd pay us while you surf the web. They send us a check twice a year. Thank you. This is important. Here's the miracle list uh, for mentally ill Christians and for troubled Christians. I send out a couple dozen of these a week, and uh, they're the most important thing you're ever going to get in an email. And if you're looking for your destiny, this will lead you right to it. As I mentioned every week, the problem is I can only get about 10% of the people I send it to to do it, but uh, I'm praying for 11%. There's a deliverance training course, 18 classes. This training course is unlike any training course anywhere in the United States in that after the class, at the end of the class, deliverance that we just taught on is demonstrated. Weird. The Holy Ghost shows up and actually does it after I taught on it. Unbelievable. Nobody else has that. Nobody has this kind of looks either. <laughs> There's uh, Seven Churches of Revelation. What's going on in our world today? <laughs> if you saw the debate yesterday, you know. Seven Churches of Revelation in the bookstore with Lori. There's our Zoom Wednesday night. This thing is booming. Booming with the anointing. Please join. You can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the link and the passcode. You go to Steps of Deliverance and get it. Man, it is fantastic. Rick and Stephanie are on there. You can download a Tithely.com app on your phone and donate to us that way if you want to. Don't forget our, about our monthly uh, prayer group over at the Healing House. Anybody uh, here for that prayer group last time? You were? How many people came? 
Was there a lot of people here? Or could they have fit over there? Okay, we usually have it over at the healing house, but if there's too many people, then we move it over here. Okay, so play it by ear. Fourth Saturday of the month at 11 o'clock, and then after that is my deliverance training course. Fourth Saturday of the month at noon in the small sanctuary here. Those are our donation boxes on the doors there. You can use those if you like. You can donate on the website on PayPal. Thank you. Don't forget about my radio show. I'm on uh, local radio, 1010 AM Christian Radio, every day of the week in the morning at 7.30 on your drive to work. And I'm on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. My podcast is on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Teach the deep things of God there. Just go to twitch.tv, put in HCCADC, and you're there. YouTubers, please remember to set up your ambush team in, at your church. Hopefully it's a mega church. Two or three people get together. And then you start hunting down sick people in your church. You take them to undisclosed locations. If they don't want to go, you physically take them. <laughs> no. You uh, take the people who want, want prayer. Okay, you don't, you don't kidnap them. And then they'll get healed. And then they'll spread the word, and then you'll be booming. And then after that, what will happen? You'll get kicked out. Okay. <clears throat> Monday nights, ladies. Another one. This thing's fantastic with Julie. Stephanie's, Stephanie's on this one. Fabulous Zoom service. 6.30, Monday's Pacific time. Tuesdays is our ladies meeting here uh, in the small sanctuary. 6.30 p.m. Okay? Live. I wrote three books. They're in the bookstore. One on Satan, one on healing, and one on curing mental illness and Christians. Tomorrow. Boom. Six o'clock tomorrow, right here where I'm standing. Healing service. Peter will be here tomorrow. Should be a good crowd tomorrow. A lot of people have RSVP. It's going to be good. These are our uh, platforms we broadcast on. Kelly does it. YouTube and Rumble tonight. And we rebroadcast on Vimeo, BitChute, and GodTube. She has those up sometime, what, Saturday, Sunday, something like that, whatever it is. Carlsbad, California. We're conducting another raid at the Senior Center, where I feel most comfortable. <laughs> They got a lot of old people there ready to kick the bucket. We're trying to get them saved before they kick it. We'll see you there Saturday, August 10th, 10 o'clock in the morning, Carlsbad, California. A lot of rich people out there. They don't have a lot of homeless in Carlsbad. And they, they don't put up with it. Spiritual warfare night. Oh. One of our weapons of our warfare are what? Binding and loosing. Got a good one here for you. I wanted to clarify some of this. Again, some of it would be a little bit controversial. Um, please bear with me. Let's check out Peter first. He kind of started this thing. And it says, Jesus said to him, Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, he was the first person in the Bible to uh, give this revelation, other than demons. He was the first human to give it. Okay? Now this placed him in a temporary special status, which was what? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That means the son of Jonah. His dad's name was Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. He was supernaturally revealed by the Holy Spirit that Jesus was the Messiah, Son of the living God. And I say to you, Peter, Petros is the Greek word for Peter there, and it means a chip off the old block. Okay? So if you had a big boulder and you knocked a chip off of it, that would be Petros. But upon this rock, the whole boulder, Petra, that would be who? Christ. Okay, so 
you and I are chips off the rock of Christ. We're not the rock, we're a chip off the rock. Correct? That was Peter. Petros, you're a chipper. I will build my church not on chipper, but the rock of Christ is what he was talking about here. The Catholics jacked this verse completely up. Not going to go into that because I'll get an email. The gates of Hades is where? Down there. Hell shall not prevail against it. Thank you. So there it is right there. There is Petra and there is us. We're chips off the rock. Matthew 16, he says to Peter, I will give you, didomi, this is a future tense Greek uh, verb, I will in the future give you, Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, keys are symbols of authority, keys. You got the key to open the door, you're the boss. I'll give you the keys in the future of the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. Whatever you, Deo, tie up, chain up, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now here's here's a problem. This is a King James Version. Kind of mistranslated a little bit. Uh, Didimenon is a past tense verb. So what he's saying is that uh, when you bind something on this earth, it's already previously been bound. And the resurrection, you're just confirming the binding. Tonight at the altar, you'll see the ministry team bind a demon and then loose the demon from the person. It'll happen right here tonight. Well, that already happened at the resurrection of Christ back there. You're just confirming it here, 2,000 years later. Whatever you uh, uh, luo, loose, untie, unchain, loose on earth has already been, lulamenon, past tense verb, it's already been loosed in the heavens. You know, like that song says, you're fighting a battle now that you've already won. Back there. The resurrection. Now let's go to phase two here on this binding and loosing weapon. Let's go to the 11 disciples. This is after the resurrection. Moreover, if my brother shall trespass against you. Excuse me, this is before the resurrection. He's talking about the uh, church now. Moreover, if your brother, talking about another Christian, sins against you, hamartano is the Greek word for sin, against you, tell him his fault, what his sin was, just between you guys in private. Remember? If he hears you, and that's a big if. If he hears you, you have gained a friend. You got your brother back. It's all done. If he will not listen to you, take two with you, one or two more other Christians, not cops, other Christians, so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, that's the golden rule for spiritual events. If you go to a prophetic church and somebody walks up to you and says, you know, the Lord would say to you, blah, blah, blah. You are to take that word, park it, and wait for God to give you two or three confirmations of what that person said. The pro prophetic movement is massively jacked up because... Someone you respect 
gives you a word and you don't get it verified. So people are running off with words that were not verified by God. So they get into prophecies, prophetic words that are wrong or misleading or incomplete. The golden rule for prophetic words is confirmation by God. The Lord would say to you, sister, I, I see a vision, sister, of Kenya. What do you do? Well, now, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. Kenya. I know I want two or three or more confirmations of Kenya. I see you, sister, a new car in your future. Okay, I'll take one confirmation. All right. This is how people emotionally get involved with fake prophetic words. Do not get involved in any of that prophetic stuff. You're going to get in big trouble. Big trouble. Okay? Unless you get... If he doesn't listen to you and the one or two other brothers or sisters in Christ, Christians now, okay, this isn't the scene from Judge Judy, then you go to where? Okay. And you go to the church. And if he doesn't hear the church, what do you do with the Christian? Penalty kick. So I get that connected to sports and stuff. Make, <laughs> makes the teaching a lot more interesting. Apparently not. Now here's how it works. Why did Jesus say this? That sounds very harsh. Here's why. Rebellion demons are the worst piles of crap you ever want to see in your church. They do not listen. They do everything they want done, and they are the same as a witch or an idolater. And so these kind of people cannot be in your church. You got to get rid of them. They'll cause division, strife. They'll cause splits, clicks, everything. Rebellion demons are extremely dangerous. Demons. Almost all mentally ill people have them. Almost all of them. Exceptions being a few noted dep patients with severe depression. Sometimes they don't have them, okay? But you get people with bipolar, borderline, dissociative, psychoses, insanity. Ugh. Rebellion demons run in the wild. They don't listen to anything anybody says, and then after they're through not listening to you, they tell you to go screw yourself to your face. I mean, they're nasty. They won't do anything. They don't listen. They're, they're awful. This is why Jesus gave this harsh method. You got three chances here. And then we can't leave somebody in a church with rebellion demons. They're going to destroy the church. You've got to get rid of them. So he said, give them the boot. Truly I say to you, whatever, whatever you, same phrase, Deo, tie up, chain up on earth, has already been tied or pain bound in heaven. And whatever you, Luo, loose on this earth, has already been Loosed in heaven. He says the same thing now. But now he's saying it to a broader group. And then he says, here's binding and loosing. I say to you, if two of you agree on earth, touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. If anybody had that verse memorized? Most of you do. That's not what it says. <clears throat> this Greek word, iteo, as I mentioned several times in the past, to ask for something is not to ask for something 
what time is it? Or can you pick me up at six? Or something like that, a general question. That's eroteo, it's a different Greek word, but this word, ateo, means that you are asking for something you've already been told you could have. So you are asking for it already knowing you're going to get it. So when you ask in that manner, there's no doubts in your mind to block the answer. If you pray a prayer and you're doubting while you're praying it, wipes out the prayer. Mark 11, if you have faith and doubt not, you will say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done, and all things whatsoever you ask, same word. See that? The asking, do you know what time you get off work Thursday? Okay, now that's not asking. That's an a ask, asking a question of in query. Yeah. You don't know when they get off work. You're not sure they're getting off work. Correct? That's not that word. Great men and women of God learned that 98% of Christians who are Mickey Mouse losers they don't understand it. How's that work? Sister Edder, Wigglesworth, and all these giant faith healers, they learned how to ask. They only ask for things they know they've already been told they could have. Wigglesworth was flabbergasted when somebody wasn't healed. He was shocked. Why? He was asking for something he knew God already told him he could have. He wasn't asking a question. What time is it? Can they be healed? How does that work? No. What? That's not the question. Anybody following me? If you are, I just put you on a track somewhere. To something special. If you touch anything you ask, knowing you're going to get before you ask it, you know you're going to get it before you ask it. Brother Mike, can I, can I be delivered tonight? I don't answer him because the answer is no. Why not? The doubt was in the question. You think God will help me tonight, Brother Mike? I don't answer him again. I run to the other side. Then I ask Kelly to go talk to him. <laughs> Why? Because they're not getting healed. There was doubt in the question. Darn it. Nuts. So when they ask me those questions that are guaranteed they will get nothing, I then try to milk them and build them up. I try to rephrase it for them, and I try and give them a mini sermon, and I whack away at them, trying to boost their faith a little bit. I just don't let them ask me that and let it go. I can't. I gotta help them. At least try to help them. It's my job. That's your job. You touch anything. What's the qualification? There aren't any. Were you told you could have it? It's a done deal. See that? It's a done deal. People who get answers to prayer, great ministers, great faith healers, on and on and on and on, all learned how to ask. The rest of the group don't know how to ask. Okay. And then he says, binding and loosing, here's another form of it, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I midst.
An extremely intelligent person once said years ago, <laughs> spiritual warriors don't negotiate cease fires. They demand a surrender. And they get it if they know how to ask. Okay, oops, 11. Yeah, this is 11. The other one should have been 12. Sorry about that. Post resurrection disciples. More binding and loosing. <clears throat> Here we go. Jesus uh, visits them and he says, Peace to you. As my Father sent me, I am sending you. You are a sent person. Where? What's none of my business? You're sent somewhere by God. Most Christians don't answer the call, but the call is still there for you. You can answer it tonight. When he said this, he... <sighs> received the Holy Ghost. Lombano, future tense, Greek verb. He's talking about Pentecost. Then it says, this is one of the strangest verses in the Bible, and there's a bunch of controversy over what it actually means. So I'll give you a couple versions of mine, and then <clears throat> they may be wrong. And then you can figure it out yourself. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted to them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now this Greek word here for remit, it's weird. Fiamme is the Greek word for forgiving, or and that means to release. Okay, so this is an anointed tissue box. You can tell it's been in a deliverance service because it's all torn up. But I'm releasing this. See that? A fiamme, I let I released it from me. When I got my sins forgiven, God released them from me. When you forgive someone, you are releasing their sins from you. Are you with me? <clears throat> if you retain them, they're retained. Okay. Now, what's this first mean? Well, nobody <laughs> really knows, but here's what I think it might mean. If I explain to someone, this is how you get saved, you have to repent of your sins, you have to come with a humble and open heart, you have to confess your sins, and you have to surrender your life to Christ, and you must experience being born again. John chapter 3. Okay? And I tell these people that, and somebody comes up to me and says, I just received Christ, I, I felt I'm born again. I, can, I have the authority by God to tell that person, your sins have been remitted from you. Because I'm preaching salvation to the person. They, they received the word. They confessed, they repented, and they were born again. So I have the authority by God to tell that person, you are sinless. Another guy comes up, you know what, I don't know, Buddha's good too. Okay, now I have the authority to tell that person, your sins are not remitted. They're retained to you. By the word of God and the fact that I'm sharing the gospel with them, and they didn't listen to me. Okay, that's, that's one interpretation of it. I got another one that I like better, and since I've used it, in my counseling practice, I think I got the best one. There's two or three other versions of this, which I'm not going to go into, but if somebody offends you and wounds you and hurts you, and you release that offense to God, and you forgive them, a fiamme, I forgave you for trashing me, stealing something from me, hurting me, abusing me, whatever, that Sin, those sins are 
released to them. They wounded me. They sinned against me. And now I have released them from them, from myself. Years ago, I read that verse, and I couldn't figure it out, and I read up on it. Nobody else knew about it, knew what it meant either. So then I took that meaning, and boom, I had so many healings from that, soul wound healings. I said, that's got to be, I got to be right. If I'm not right, I, I'm not going to admit it. I'm just going to keep using it <laughs> because it was working. It worked. These people were getting their soul wounds out. And if they wouldn't do it, no, no, I, they, they did this to my, my mom. They did that. Oh, I can't. Hey, man, you, you're not released. No, you have to go home sick. They're retained to you. Now, you may have a different de definition. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. That's John 20, 23, if you want to research it. Really interesting verse. But it's a form of binding and loosing. That's what, what a point I'm trying to make you. Now let's check Paul out. He used this uh, concept in his ministry. 1 Corinthians 5. He gets some information that uh, somebody died in the church and his son uh, took his wife. So the son had the stepmom. When Paul heard about this, he freaked. And he said, in the name of the Lord, when you are together with my spirit and with the power, dunamis, supernatural power of the Lord Jesus, deliver such a person to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Paradidomi means to completely turn something over, okay? Here, you can have this. You can have it. Now that's D to me. I'm surrendering that to you. But if I completely surrender it, I'm done with it. It's gone. This is harsh. Okay. Now why was Paul doing that? Well, he doesn't say, but my suspicion is that in my experience, you know, watching places like Southern Baptist and Hillsong and Acts 29 and all these other sex scandals that break out in these organizations, Boy Scouts and how many, that's four, there's been dozens. If you let lust demons loose in your organization, your town, your employer, your church, your family, They'll spread. They always spread. Because when this person and that person are lusting together, there's transfers. Then when this person goes over there and lusts with that one, another one. They spread around the church, and pretty soon, you got all, people, all kinds of people commit adultery and fornicating in church. Spreads like weeds. That's why all these scandals break out. Every time one breaks out, I do a radio show on it. Explaining to people how this works. These are lust demons. They're spreading in the organization. Because you didn't cut the cancer out. Paul said, cut this guy. Now, why would he want to turn him over to Satan? That's not very loving. Yes, it is. Uh, some Christians will not change unless they get beat up. They won't do it. For different reasons. Stubbornness, laziness, indifference, whatever it is. Some people will not change unless they are beaten into changing. And God, in his infinite mercy, allows you to take a beating so you will change your attitude.
when the business was going great, you had all kinds of pride. Oop, bankruptcy. Oh, I'm changing now. God doesn't cause these crappy things. He allows them to happen to get you to change. It worked. The guy took a vicious beating. They booted him out of the church. 2 Corinthians. They wouldn't take him back. And Paul came back and said, take him back. You know, <laughs> you know don't beat the guy to death. He repented. Let him back in. Where's your mercy? Come on now. If somebody repents, you take them back. Because God took them back. But if they're not going to repent, hey, you turn them over to the devil. Stop praying for them. You let the sowing and reaping happen. And then suddenly they change their mind. Oh my God. There's nothing like a sickness or a car accident or something like that to Get person to, whoa, take a second look at their life. And some Christians, if that doesn't happen to them, they never change. Never. Well, this is kind of harsh. No, it's actually love. You know, bad things happen for a reason. They're not random. It's not chaos in the spirit world. Somebody knows what's going on. Now, if something bad happens to somebody, it doesn't mean that they're, there's something wrong with them. They're sinning. Hey, that's, that's none of your business. But in this case here, this guy got a whooping by the devil. And then when he got it, he came back to the church and said, hey, I've changed my mind. I got beat up here. I repent. I'm not going to be sleeping with my stepmom anymore. I quit. That's repentance, correct? <clears throat> you ever heard somebody say, why can't I repent every day? Okay, they, they didn't repent the first day. That's, that's a oxymoron. I repent every day. Stupid. When you repent, it means you stopped doing that. Yeah. Right? So if I slap you in the face, oh, I repent. I'm so sorry. And I come back and that, that's not repentance. Repentance is stopping doing it. Metanoeo means to quit doing that. <laughs> See the difference? Well, this guy quit doing it. He came back in 2 Corinthians. They wouldn't take him back. They saw him as a piece of garbage. And Paul said, you in grief. Knock it off. Why did that happen? Here's why. It's love. Some Christians will not change unless they're beaten into it. Sorry to say that, and it's painful to say that. I've seen, I don't know, a dozen or so people over the years that didn't change until they were on their deathbed. Then they changed. Then they died. So, if you get a chance to repent tonight, I'd do it now before God has to encourage you to repent in love. I would just go ahead and voluntarily do it. Easier way to go. And the guy's spirit was saved. Worked out great. First Timothy 1. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. According to the prophecies that went on before you, that you might war a good warfare. By doing what? One, holding faith with a good conscience. Oh, God. I just went over it. All these preachers, all these churches, all kinds of talented, anointed people in the church, Seared consciences. I went on a rant a few weeks ago about worship, the worship team. Have you ever met people on the worship team? Oh, well, I'd recommend you don't. Crap's going on in the worship team, you can't even believe. I mean, sinning's going on, you'd be stunned. How do you know all these things, Mike? Well, 
I'm a counselor and people come in and they tell me their deep dark secrets. I'm not like somebody who thinks he knows, I'm somebody who actually knows. There's a difference. These people, these people that keep sinning over and over again, why are they doing that? Their conscience is seared. But they have faith. They get up and preach a great sermon. They pray for the sick. They feed the home. They're doing all kinds of ministry stuff. And then behind the scenes, they're doing some kind of weird sinning. What is that telling you? They have faith, but they don't have a good conscience. Mike, that sounds utterly crazy. It is not crazy. Many people have strong faith in God who have shady consciences. Money, sex, whatever it is. It's routine. So Paul says, hey, you've got to have both. Faith and a good conscience. Those people are dangerous to the devil. Somebody with one is not. Some people have thrown away their faith. Why? Apotheo means to toss out or toss it in the trash. Concerning faith, they made now a gale. Was that? That was a naval term used to describe boats that were trapped in various places and couldn't get to the dock, the reef, or whatever. I thought once you were saved, you were always saved. No, you can shipwreck your faith when you have a bad conscience. It leads to you doing things, saying things, hanging around people, watching things that you, sh that you shouldn't be doing. That's a conscience issue, not a faith issue. For example, Paul says, Here's, here's two guys. You remember in Acts chapter 19, Alexander, he stood up in front of the crowd. The guy was a superpowered Christian. Paul's partner. What happened? No, well, it doesn't say what happened, but these two guys here shipwrecked their faith. And I did to them what I did to the guy that was marrying his stepmom. I did the same thing, paradidomi, same Greek word. I completely released them, these two guys, to Paul's not very nice, he's too harsh. No, he's doing exactly what has to be done to keep sin and demons from spreading through the church. He's fighting to save the church. By getting rid of a bad apple, he saves the rest of the bushel. You getting rid of some of your crappy friends is a great idea. So they don't contaminate you. So they have to learn not to blaspheme. Whatever they were doing was apparently extremely horrible now. They had you ever met a backslider? There's nothing worse than an embittered backslider. Man, they are in a bad, rotten mood. They sin more now than they did before they were saved. Because now they're angry at God. Blasphemy. Holy smoke. How can a born-again Christian, spirit-filled Christian, start blaspheming? Well, yeah, once you're saved, you're always saved. Oh, okay. Second Timothy 2. Their word will eat like a gangrena. What is that? Gangrene, that's right. That's where we got an English word gangrene. And he says, these two guys here are examples. 
These are all former born again servants of God Concerning the truth they have erred and they keep telling everybody that the resurrection is past And so that's causing confusion in the church And a trip out like flipping a boat over or a chair over they flipped the other people's faith. Now they don't know what to believe. Is the resurrection? Did I miss it? Is it what? Oh, oh my God! I might have missed it. But Paul said, John said, no. They said what? Split, church split, doctrine, <laughs> right? What church splits the most? Anybody know? Yeah, Baptists. They're the worst. As soon as somebody comes up with a new idea, boom, church split. They're done. There's 64 different Baptist dom denominations. 64. How do you do that? How do you have that many things to split over? 64 different denominations of Baptists? Southern Baptist, Free Will Baptist, non Free Will Baptist, Parking Lot Baptist. <laughs> 64? That is ridiculous. That is crazy. There's only like 16 different Pentecostal denominations. 16. That's all there is, right? Why do they have all these denominations? They're all satanic. Why, how'd they get that way? Splits. The doctrinal split. I believe that. I bl split. As soon as the church split, they all covet the name first because everybody wants to be the first. You know, first Baptist, first Assembly of God. First. Nobody wants to be a second Baptist. <laughs> Nobody's going to donate to the second Baptist. Stupid. Church denominations are satanic. They're all split over doctrinal issues. They had a big fight. <laughs> and it's usually over a non-essential topic. Something that doesn't, you can believe it or not, you can still go to heaven. You know, it's not, it's not a mainline thing. I mean, how do Pentecostals have a split? How does that work? What, what is happening? United Pentecostal. Well, we believe that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are just one person. He just splits up into odd figures. Is that, is that worth a split? Why do you? <laughs> oh, we're free will Baptists. What does that mean? Well, we believe that people have free will. Is that worth splitting a national denomination over? Huh? Maybe I'm missing something. I probably am. It's my fault. Overthrowing the faith of thumb is the way you teach it, teach the word of God, and then somebody comes along and contradicts it. Then this group sticks with that one, that group sticks with that one. Split. Usually over nothing. That happened here. It happened with Paul. Alexander the copper says, did me much evil. Oh boy. 2 Timothy 4. The Lord reward him according to his works. By the way, you need to watch out for him too. Why is Paul so nasty? Because he's looking out for the greater good. He's taking these, a bad apple, pull it out of the thing, and get rid of it. So you don't rot the rest out. Some people are so infected with demons and so destructive and so 
cause so much controversy. You got to get rid of them bag them Nowadays they don't do that big churches nah. Now everybody gets a second third and fourth chance. Hey That's because they don't re preach repentance when you repent you stopped doing it you Keep doing it over and over you're not repenting They need to get the boot Right away, no. You you give them grace. You work with them, and so on. I'm not saying you somebody screws up, and you throw them out. No, obviously that's ridiculous. You'd never have anybody in your church. Place would be empty. You wouldn't be there. <laughs> Look at that sowing and reaping. What Paul taught the Galatians: Hey, you reap what you sow, man. He tried to stop our words. He was fighting against the gospel of Christ, and Paul said. Hey, he's gonna reap what he sows. Let's look at some examples of binding and loosing. Okay. Acts 13. When they gone to the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer there, a Greek word magus. Now that Greek word is different from the other term, which is what? Pharmakia. A magus is where we get our English word magician. Pharmacia is where we get our English word Pharmacy He's a false prophet He's a Jew His name is bar Jesus Barisius Jesus's name was Jesus This guy was claiming he was Jesus son in the Apocrypha and some of the phony writings that were not included in our Bible There are stories about Jesus not going to the cross marrying Mary Magdalene having a family and having a family Remember that? You heard that one? No, it's in there. Well this guy this guy here is saying he's the son of Jesus That's his claim to fame. He's trying to hook on to the celebrity and they were with the, de the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul. This guy wanted to get saved. How do we know that? Epizoteo means he was eagerly and urgently pursuing it. Aggressively. That's the only way to get a miracle from God. Did you know that? You can't just casually come down here and get delivered or healed. It's not going to happen. You're lazy. That's what you are. Lazy. This guy wasn't. He was pushing it. I want to know about it. Give me that information. I want to get saved. A preacher's dream. I'm afraid you're hitting the lottery there. Somebody who's aggressively pursuing God. Oh man, that's an easy evening. Holy Ghost just mops up. It's the one you got to drag out of. <laughs> okay, let's just say this prayer. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh no. Okay, I'll pray after me then. So, you know, I'll use any tactic. Oh no. I'm trying to get it jump started. The ones who don't have the jump start, this guy. Oh man. Thank you. Wow, what an easy revival that is. He was eagerly desiring, desiring to hear the word of God. And there it is. In 1887, they found this uh, in Israel, near Palestine. A rock with his name on it. Carved, carved in his name. They, they know this guy was real. In, in Paphos. Acts 13 again, Elamus the sorcerer, so is his name by interpretation, he withstood them. And he was seeking, Zateo means he was eagerly trying to turn away the deputy from listening to Paul telling him about Christ. Steostrepho means to distort. So what's happening here is Paul saying, now the Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Well, so did Buddha 
and then this, and then he'd pipe up. Then, then he would tell. Then he'd pipe up again. That's what was happening. It was a constant interchange. He was constantly interrupting while he was trying to get this Paula saved. Okay, see what's happening. He's butting in. Then Saul. Filled with the Holy Ghost, that's the key. Sets his eyes on him, starts staring right at the guy. He starts staring him down like a way in an MMA fight. You are full of subtlety and mischief. You are a child of the devil. He said he was Jesus' child. Paul then tells him, hey, this guy's not the son of Christ. He's the son of the devil. And he's also the enemy, like the devil, of all in all righteousness and perverting the right ways of the Lord. Perverting meaning he would tell him the truth and he would butt in with a lie. Then he would tell him another, and then this guy would pop up. They were having a group conversation. This guy comes up and butts in. And it came to pass, you know what happened to that guy. He became blind. Acts 16. Now here's Paul using binding and loosing again. It says, it came to pass as we went to prayer, a Padiski, a female slave, echo in the grip of a spirit of divination, Puthon, which is where we get our English word, python, snake, like a snake. <clears throat> By the way, that's very common for people to kind of act like snakes when they have familiar spirits or they've been involved in New Age. When the demons are coming out, it kind of looks like a, in a way, not exactly, but it kind of looks that way. And then it says, she brought her masters much gain by Mantuomai fortune telling. <clears throat> Ninety something percent of all fortune tellers are fake, but there's a small percent, hey, that's real. She was one of the real deals. What is a fortune teller? A mantua, my spirit, is they get involved in fortune telling. You've got to open up your third eye spiritually to be able to get this information from demons. Or the same type of demons create people who are what? Have you ever, have you ever met an empath? No? Really interesting. There's three kinds of empaths. Uh, emotional ones. So if you come into my parlor and you pay me, I am able to feel the exact same emotions you're feeling over that trauma, whatever it was, or whatever reason you came in. I can feel the same emotions that person feels. And I'm, I'm in pain. The pain of that person, trans he was in a car accident. His depression transferred to me. I'm an empath. I have that spiritual gift. Then there's the same thing with physical. The pain in the person transfers to the empath. Then now their leg hurts. Their, their, their spleen hurts. Or their what? Whatever. You have the pain of that person that you're trying to help. This, this is real. Some people really have this. Some people claim to have it, but don't. But a small percent actually have these demons. And then it's perception. Oh, man. Were you in the back of the car years ago when somebody came up and pooped? Oh, yeah, I was. I, my God, how'd you know that? So now you're, he's instantly bonded to me as credible. I am now credible to him. So I can then get him loaded with demons. Because I told him something about. You have a, you have a bad feeling when you, when you get around fish, don't you? you know, oh, I thought, well, how do you know that? I hate fish. 
Okay, so now I got a bond, see. I'm an empath. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're all looking at me like uh, I've been taking various levels of drugs. I am not. This is, I'm talking about new age here. I'm not talking about us. I, I was just explaining something different. <clears throat> Christians also have these empath anointings, but it comes from kundalini spirits. It's big now in Christianity. A lot of people are an empath. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But it's spreading pretty fast in Christianity. And they do stuff like guided med meditation. Uh, they have you, they have you, uh, you know, sit down or lay down. And now I want you to visualize Jesus coming in and he's got a big smile on his face. Close your eyes and just relax. Breathe. Breathe and see Jesus coming in. Can you see him there? And he's going to give you a big hug. Can you see Jesus coming up and giving you a big hug? There you go. How's that feel? Well, that feels good. Well, it feels good because the spirit just transferred into him. Now they're going to see Jesus, you know, on a regular basis. Empaths. Christian empaths. They have... Oh gosh, your back's hurting you now. Oh God, my back's hurting. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, help heal this back. Oh, heal it. Oh, ow. They actually feel what they feel. Ministers. This is in Christianity now. Anyway, it's, it's all new age stuff. That's where we got it. Again, Acts 16, the same followed Paul and all of us, and they were Kradzo yelling at us, and she was yelling, these men are the servants, slaves, the doulos, slaves of the Most High God, which shows us salvation. This she did many days, Paul being grieved, that wasn't a good word to translation there, grieved, diapon eomai means to agitated. He's starting getting a little hacked. Because like Elamus the sorcerer, this gal was constantly interrupting him. See, and Paul didn't like to be interrupted when he was spreading the gospel. And he'd give you a little grace, but then later on he said, i got to do something about this. I've had it. I'd recommend you do that tonight. You know, you've, you've reached kind of this level right here with the devil kicking your face in, hadn't you? You about kind of tired of that? You about up to here somewhere? Oh, good. You still down here? Oh, shoot. It's going to be a long night for me. You need to get to the point in life where you've had it with the devil. You know that? You just had it up to here. Yeah, you've had it. Sick of your daughter getting pregnant. You had it. Your son relapsed again. You had it up to here. Finances. Got a bunch of money on Tuesday, and next Tuesday you're broke. You about had it. Why didn't God help me before that? He was waiting for you to get to the point where you just about had it. He wants you to get to that point where you've had it. I've had enough of that. That used to happen to me when I was a kid. Me and my sister would be sitting in the back seat, mom driving, and then I'd start pestering her pecking her, pulling on her, doing something stupid. Mother would yell at her from the back seat, stop that, quit that, knock it off. I didn't stop. She was yelling, Mom! Boom! Mom! Boom! It was like a doll. But when I saw the shoulder go up, it was time to stop. Because the next thing coming back was, and the hand, she'd still be driving, head that way, and the hand would be going sweep pattern. <laughs> what happened? My mom had had it up to here. She had driven a couple of miles with me. And then she got to the seventh block. Her shoulder went up. <laughs> that put the fear of God in me. And then the sweeping motion. <laughs> I 
I pray to God you get it tonight. Why don't you just get to the point where you have had it with the devil? You're sick of it. Paul had it, man. I cannot take this anymore. What's he doing here? Teaching us that your problems in life are not your sister and your brother and your parents or your spouse. This is the problem in life is the spirit behind them. They're just using these puppeteers to jack you around. That's all it is. They're being used. Paul knew that girl was being used. The demon was the one following him and yelling at him. Paul had had it up to here, not with a girl. Satan. That's never going to happen to you. You know why? Because you keep yelling at the person. Will you stop that? Nah, get off! Fool. Demons want you to yell at them. They like it. Have you ever seen an idiot that cusses demons out? You dirty SOB, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kick your face in. Demons are holding their guts laughing at you. They're so happy you got mad at them. They're training you to use your anger in a useless manner. They're teaching you to be a fool. They love it. You're doing exactly what they wanted you to do. Here it is right here. The spirit. He did not turn to the girl. What a great lesson. I command you in the name of Jesus. I read that years ago. 2004 I think it was. I thought, man, that, that phrase looks pretty good. Then that's the only phrase I would use. When I got in the deliverance ministry in 05. I command you in the name of Jesus. I ran that in the ground. I used it all the time. Then I saw some one guy casting demons on somebody and he wasn't using it. I go, wait a minute, I'm starting to get legalistic here. I had to repent of it. Then I started trying it. I bind you, spirit. Come out! It came out. You can go overboard with legalism, can't you? I mean, I did. I didn't say that was bad. I just said I, I thought that you had to, you know. He came out. There it goes. Acts chapter 12. More binding and loosing. Here we go. Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex the church. He killed James, John's brother, chopped his head off. It made the Jews happy, so he took Peter. Remember? You've all read this story, right? He's in jail. He's in jail now. And when he took him, he put him in prison, and he did a uh, Tetradian is a group of four soldiers. That's what they make up. So a legion would be 4,500 to 6,000 soldiers, but this is just a small, small band of soldiers. Tetradian. They're watching. The prisoners and so what they did back then was Two guy, one or two guys would stay with the Prisoners then another one would guard that gate and another one would guard that gate and another one would guard the outer gate and just they were all, all over the place like kind of like a Leavenworth And uh, they needed four of these guys just to keep one guy That tells you how powerful Peter was and his popularity. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now why in God's name the King James Bible people translated Passover as Easter, I have no idea. That is probably the worst translation error in the entire King James Bible. Uh, at least what I found. Easter you got to be kidding. It was Pascha, Passover, okay? He was going to bring him forth to the people, and Peter was kept in prison, but prayers were made without ceasing, another form of binding and loosing. 
For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. If two of you shall ask anything according to, that's all part of the whole system of binding and loosing. Correct? They prayed without ceasing to God, making intercession for the guy. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, just before he was going to bring him out and then kill him for the Jews, that same night, Peter was sleeping with two of the soldiers. He was bound with chains. The keepers were over at the door, blocking this door and then blocking that one and so on. And the angel of the Lord came into the prison. And a big old light shined in the prison. Right? Because they were pitch dark in there. Maybe a candle here and there, but you couldn't see anything. So the angel comes in full of light. And he, Patasso, Peter on the plura. This is a weird sentence. He whacks him. Not goes like that. He punches the guy. Apparently he was in a deep sleep and hits him in the ribs. Weird. And raised him up, grabs a guy, and then yells at him, stand up, dude. Bang! Stand up. Why was he doing that? I don't know. I would have loved to have been there to see that. That's a weird exchange going on there, but interesting, to say the least. And he stands up. Stand up, boy. The chains fall off his hands. They just fall off. How do angels do that? I don't know. I was hoping you'd tell me. The angel said, gird yourself. Put your sandals on. Come on. Follow me out of here. Okay, now Peter just woke up from a deep sleep. Had he gone like this, he wouldn't have woke up, so he whacks the guy in the ribs. Pah! Weird. <clears throat> I prefer gentler angels myself. <laughs> he went out and followed him and didn't see Edu means to see with your eyes. He didn't see what was happening. He thought he was having a vision. See that? He's wondering as he's in a half stupor, what is going on here? The thing fell off. I'm following this guy out. Oh, I know what, I know what I'm having. I'm having a vision. That's it. That's his con conclusion. Yeah. When they were past the first and second guard, for Lake, guard cage area, caged area, first and second cage area, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. So back then, they would put the most dangerous criminals in the, in the hole, so to speak. So you had to go through a series of steps to get clear back there. The other prisoners that weren't, they were out in this section. Some were in this section. Just like our prisons. You have the more dangerous prisons in certain areas. Prisoners in certain areas. Same thing here. Then they come to the iron gauge of the city. <laughs> and they opened automatus. Aut what does that mean? That's where we get our English word. Automatically. How does that work? I don't know. He doesn't have to open the gate like I would. It just opened. I have no idea how that works. The thing opened on its own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street. There it is. What is one street? I don't know. It must have been the main street in town. Like down here in Phoenix, Central. They're on one street. Probably all the restaurants were there and everything. And the angel leaves him. Where do you go? Paul, the, Peter, the, he realizes, hey, no, this wasn't a vision. I'm really out of jail now. I'm standing out here on the street. 
you know, he, by the time they got through there, he had woke up and had come to his senses. Now, if you wake up in the morning, you got pain in your ribs, you might have had a visitation. Oh, God may be calling you. That's another example of what? Binding and loosing. They were interceding for him. He's in the prison. And what happened to old Herod? Killed James and put Peter in prison. Uh-oh. Dead. Now let's take a look at some binding and loosing with the Lord Jesus. Matthew 12. Jesus knew their thoughts. This is where Edu means to visually see something. Apparently, his uh, gift of knowledge was so high, he could see thoughts. Well, that's impossible. Well, I, you know what? I don't think it is. And again, I was in Lagos, Nigeria at a uh, church and it was Sunday morning. It was my turn to preach. And uh, it was a church of about 25 people, something like that. I remember praying real hard because I had to go to the bathroom. They didn't have a bathroom at the church. And uh, after I had sized up the place and... Uh, I said, man, I gotta, I gotta do something here. So I noticed out there was a tree line by the church. So I said, uh, <clears throat> I told uh, Francis, I was over there with Francis. I'm gonna go pray for a minute. <laughs> I moved out to the tree line, <laughs> race back. I'm on. Barely made it back in time. I'm preaching away on the gifts of the Spirit and different things and hit, hit the gift of tongues. And then I had an altar call. Who wants to receive their gift of tongues filled with the Spirit? Well, about 12 people came up. It was great. I felt fantastic. I was rolling. I start now. Here's what you do, and I instructed them how to do it. Take a breath and just reach out. Well, this one lady bursts out, bursts out in tongues. This lady here to my right, and then after the service, this lady here comes up to me. She said, "I, I, it was amazing. I saw my tongues going through the church." I said, "What do you mean you saw your tongues? It was, it was coming through as I was speaking it. It was, I saw it coming through the church." It went out the window there. I said, what? you saw your tongues going through out there? Yes. She was crying in tears. Amazing. She could actually see it in some kind of language. <laughs> I didn't see it. I could not see nothing. Okay. So thoughts, it says he saw their thoughts. I believe that, particularly because I had that experience in, in Lagos. Thumasis, what is that? They were thinking, they were thinking, and, do, and do, thinking about something. They were drawing conclusions. They were collating. And he could see what they were thinking. Amazing. And then Jesus says, listen, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to nothing. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Isn't that the truth in America? So you're looking at about 50% of heterosexual marriages end up in divorce. About 60% of gay marriages end up in divorce. About 70% of trans marriages end up in a house, a family, a business, a church divided against itself becomes a Baptist. 
<laughs> Another denomination. I hope they get it up to 70. I'm pulling for them. It will not stand if you're divided. You can't do it. Unity is the key. Unity. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided. How can his kingdom stand? Now he's saying all these things and nobody said anything to him. He saw what they were thinking. Wow. Now that's an anointing. My goodness. If I buy Beelzebub, cast out devils, who do your children cast them out by? They're your judges. And as you know, in the Old Testament here, Baalzebub, here. Baal, there's, there's a statue of Baal, probably 3,000 years old, something like that. Some of them were like bulls or horses. Well, that was the god of Ekron here. Baalzebub. Well, the Jews turned it into Beelzebub. And this means the Lord of the Flies. This means the Lord of the Flies of the Dung. So the Jews made fun of the god of Ekron by calling it the dung god or the poop god because that's where the flies go when you take a dump. The flies come over to the poop. And that's how the Jews made fun of their idols. That's what that means. Beelzebub. If I cast out devils by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, then that means the kingdom of God has come to you. This verse was so encouraging to me years ago when I first started. When I first started the ministry, I assumed I was going to be more popular than Joel Osteen. <laughs> Look at this, the Holy Spirit's moving. That person got delivered from demons. That's amazing, isn't it? Nope. <clears throat> I couldn't believe it. It was the first time in my life people didn't just love me. I was so used to being just adored. Got in the ministry. That's Arabic. I went down the tubes. I had no idea. Nobody wanted anything to do with demons. I got tossed. But this kept me going. If the Spirit of God's moving, and the demons are coming up, then I am part of the kingdom. And that's how I self encourage myself. <laughs> None of the pastors wanted anything to do with me, but I kept encouraging myself. I use this verse. You got to use something or you won't make it. And that's how you, they knew that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Why? Because. He was establishing his kingdom over Satan's. He was driving out the demons from the kingdom of darkness, proving he was from the kingdom of light. That's how it works. How can one enter into a strong man's house and uh, the Arpazzo steal everything he's got if he doesn't bind the strong man first? Then he will steal all the stuff in his house. When a strong man arm keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. When a stronger one comes upon him, he overcomes him. I believe this is talking about a spiritual war, not just a physical one. And so he was talking about the Holy Ghost being numero uno and the demons being nothing to him. Thereby establishing the kingdom of God over the kingdom of Satan. The strong man was the Holy Spirit coming in, kicking everybody's face in. He loves to do that. I better stop or I'll go for 20 minutes on the Holy Ghost. But you know who he's looking for? Somebody with some childlike faith so he can kick some tail. That's all he needs is a vessel with some childlike faith that he moves big. That's all he needs. 
If he doesn't have it, nothing happens. I can get up here and teach the most wonderful teaching you could ever, ever hear. I could tell you the greatest jokes you've ever heard. I could wear the best outfit. And I just described myself to a T right there. But if that's it, if that's it, I got nothing at the end of the service. I got nothing. Nothing. They've done research on sermons. Haven't they? Yeah. A huge percentage of everything you hear in a sermon, you forget by the time you get to the car. By the time you're done at Golden Corral, it's another 30 or 40 percent gone. Preaching sermons alone doesn't work. It does not work. Teaching stuff doesn't work. Well, you just insulted Charles Stanley. Hey, I like Charles Stanley. He got a huge IQ, all kinds of doctors agree. He's a good teacher, but Charlie didn't get it. Charlie didn't get it. You can't teach people into changing their lives. It has to be the moving of the Spirit. It's got to be God's Holy Ghost. Anybody here go to church? Anybody? You do? You go to church Sunday? You have a pastor there? He preached sermon. Moles it on. I just rested my case. Now, <laughs> what I'm trying to get you to understand, without the Holy Ghost moving, teaching and preaching is no good. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. It says Jesus went into Galilee when he left the devil squirming in the desert. Remember that? It said he went in there. He went into Galilee preaching, teaching, and healing. Preaching, teaching, and healing. One, two, three. Preaching and teaching wasn't good enough, was it? No. Confirming what he was preaching and teaching sealed the deal. I could Charles Stanley, Stanley you for two, four, two more hours. Yeah, and it's such a wonderful teaching. I, I do such a good job. But at the end of the teaching, I would have nothing. I could teach for another hour, and boy, it would be great. What would I have at the end of the hour? A lot of people envying me. Well, I wish I could do that. What I'm looking for is the moving of the Spirit so people can be actually helped, which is something I'm not able to do. I cannot help anybody. I can't heal anybody. I, I don't got nothing. But when he shows up, Boom. We've got a shot at everything. Anything can happen. Now I'm done. He takes all of his armor he trusted in and he does what? Diadidomi distributes what they steal. We're going to steal all your stuff, and then we're going to get, here, you get your portion, you get your cut, you get your cut. And that's what he's talking about. The strong guy goes in, overcomes the other strong guy, steals all his stuff, and then hands it out. That's what the Holy Ghost did. He goes in, steals the devil's stuff, cleans him out, and gives gifts unto men. He distributes it. Welcome to San Francisco. Now, if you're there, uh, they, have a, they have an interesting program there of helping the poor. <laughs> you're allowed to steal up to $950 there, see? And you only get a ticket, like, like a traffic ticket. 
if you go if you steal nine hundred fifty one dollar, you're in some trouble. That's a felony. These are what spoils. Those are the spoils. They go in and steal them, and then they distribute them to others. That's what the Holy Spirit does. <clears throat> All right, what are examples of binding and loosing? Let, we'll go home quickly. There's a Mark 1. Remember the guy screaming in the synagogue? Right in the middle of Jesus' sermon. He's teaching them, and this demon butts in and panics and starts screaming. That guy got delivered. What about this one here, Mark 5? The maniac of Gadara. Severely mentally ill man running to Jesus for help. Higgs. Guy got delivered. That's binding and loosing, right? Seven. A woman from Syria came chasing Jesus down to get her daughter healed. Remember that one? Boom. She got delivered. Go home. The devil has gone out of your daughter. Yes. Nine. Deaf and dumb spirits. These are the worst demons. They give autism, Down syndrome, severe mental illnesses. These things are monsters. This father brought his son to the disciples. They couldn't cast them out. And then Jesus came over. Remember that story? That's a form of binding and loosing, correct? The two maniacs of Gergesena, Matthew 8, same thing. Binding and loosing. Matthew, Matthew 9. Some guy was mute, couldn't talk. He got delivered. A demon was causing it. He started talking. This one here. This guy was blind and couldn't talk because of the spirit. Spirit come out. Matthew 12. Guy's fine. Luke 11. That guy couldn't speak. All examples of binding and loosing. Examples of not binding and loosing. The sons of Sceva. Here's, here's some guys who are religious dudes. Now, I got to give them an A for effort here. They were watching. They were watching these apostles delivering people from demons. They were listening to what they were saying. In other words, it was a kind of a form of YouTube. And so they went out to to do it. Well, that's how you do it. And so, hats off to them. They're quick learners or visual learners. But they didn't understand the spiritual ramifications of being able to minister in the spirit. Whether it's deliverance or healing or anything. There's a requirement involved. First of all, you've got to be a born-again Christian. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You got to, had to have repented of your sins. You got to have some kind of prayer life. You've got to exercise your faith. You got to build up your anointing. You got to study the word. There's a background to this. You can't just run out and do it like that. Well, they got they got the stuff and beat out of them by a demon. Did it? A demon did it. Binding demons and others. Hey, this is a risky, risky habit here. Uh, you cannot bind demons in someone who likes their demons and wants to keep them. Now, if the demon's attacking you, that's a different story. We went through two examples of Paul where he was being attacked by a spirit. That's a different deal. But me coming up and binding your demons, and you want to keep them, you're going to get in trouble. That's not going to work. If it does work, it's not going to work long. Marriage spirits. Oh, you got a rotten spouse. Your spouse is loaded with demons, so you get up every morning. I bind every spirit in my husband in the name of Jesus. In my experience, they always get much worse. I get a call later. Oh my God, he's gone off the deep end. Why? You cannot bind spirits in your spouse if they want to keep them. They're not going to repent. 
They don't want to be delivered. They don't want to change. And you're binding their demon. Now, if they're attacking you, that's again, that's a horse of a different color. But you can't just arbitrarily bind your spirits and your crazy wife. I bind that sh Amazon shopping spirit in Jesus. <laughs> it might work for an afternoon, but don't, you'll hear the ding dong. <laughs> going, oh, they're the packages. More than before. Okay. In my experience, the spouses get worse. I do not recommend you do that. I right, hear you go. We we went over this a couple times. I recommend you not do that. In my experience, you're going to get destroyed. We're going to have a big prayer meeting. We're going to knock out all the demons in Central Phoenix. We're going to command them to go to Tulsa. Okay, that's not going to work, and we don't have any authority for those demons up there. Those, the Daniel demons. Daniel, remember that story? Yeah, the Holy Ghost takes care of all that way up there. We are only commissioned to handle the stuff down here. Okay. I don't have any authority to get a demon out of you. And your granddad in Ireland. I, I can't do that. I command the demons come out of your granddad in Ireland and it's stop molesting children in the name of Jesus. He wants to keep his demons. I can't cast them out. This person, however, that's a different story. Territorial warfare, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the methodia, hidden plans of the devil. Ephesians chapter 6. Methodia are secret plans. And every one of you and myself all have these. Everybody, every born again Christian without an exception has plans the devil has set up against you that are secret. Nobody knows about it. Plans for your future. Sneak attacks. Adversity. Tribulation. Trial. Secret things you know nothing about. Nothing deals. We can stand against them if you put on the a few pieces of armor. No, uh, -uh. it says all of it. Okay, so if you put on ninety percent of it, how are we doing? Poor, doing poor. Raise your hand if you don't want to be poor. Ninety percent of it doesn't work. It doesn't say that. It says ho. Thank you. For we pale. That was a, a Greek word used in the Roman Colosseum for uh, back then they had wrestling to the death. You know, the, these people were crazy. You got in a wrestling match and somebody died. These people were sick. The crowd loved it. They were sick. So Paul goes, I'll use this wrestling term to illustrate what it's like to fight in the spirit world. We're not actually physically wrestling demons. You can't do that. But against principalities, our case, spiritual uh, rulers and exosia, spiritual authorities. That's who we wrestle against. Not, not other people, flesh and blood. And it says against the rulers of the darkness, cosmocrator, world rulers, demons running the planet, Against spiritual wickedness, us perversions, spiritual perversion in Eperonius, uh, the heavenlies, or to use our term, the atmosphere. Now, uh, I've shown you this many times before. I'll just take one second. All these scriptures there look like this. 
the hierarchy of the kingdom of God. And up here, of course, is Satan. I didn't put him on there, but there's the there's the thrones, the lordships, the spiritual perversions, the world rulers, spiritual authorities, spiritual rulers, run running uh, run of the mill demons. And as you go up the line, they increase in power and authority. So, so we're fighting down here. You know? And it says, I showed you this before, I'll take a second. There's the Greek word, Eperonius, the heavenlies. This is the heavenlies. Oranos is heaven, where God lives. Which is, according to Isaiah, in the northern part of the universe somewhere. Where that is, I don't know. Here's our world here, and we fight in this realm here, the heavenlies. Not heaven, heavenlies. Is what that verse saying. See that? High places, heavenlies. Not in heaven where God is. We're not fighting demons in heaven. We're down here. There. Luke chapter 10. The 70 returned with joy. And they said, The Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. Luke chapter 10. It says, Jesus said, I beheld Satan falling from Heaven like lightning. Now that's territorial warfare. Okay? Now that's none of my business. When that happened, I do not know. It could have been millions of years ago. I don't know what's going on here. But the point is, this is real uh, territorial warfare. Satan was apparently fell out of heaven somehow. He got, got the boot. And Jesus said, I saw it. I was standing there watching it. Then he says, Behold, I give you authority to tread. Greek words pateo. It means to stomp. Stomp on serpents and scorpions. Those are symbolic for demons. And over all the supernatural power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now we're in trouble here. Okay? So... This word all, then, has caused some people to think that they have authority over all of the kingdom of darkness. So I have the ability, then, to cast Satan to hell, uh, to demand in Jesus' name that the fallen angel do the polka. Come down here and polka. Uh, I have authority. I do not. We do not have that. That's not going to work. Okay. We only have the illustrations in the Word of God, and we're fighting down here in this arena here. We're not fighting there, and I cannot command Satan to put on a tutu. Okay, I can't command Satan to stop attacking Yugoslavia. I. I we don't have these kind of powers. We don't have this kind of authority. That's reserved with Father some other place. Okay. So people look at this and then they develop false doctrines because they saw all. Okay. Which isn't true. I don't have all authority over Satan. That's ridiculous. Notwithstanding, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice because you're born again Christians. Your names are in heaven. <laughs> in the beginning, I violated the scripture. Back in 04 or something, I was so happy. I was casting out demons. I was like, like a hobby. I was thrilled. I thought it was exciting. I would laugh and giggle and rejoice and dance and jump around. I thought it was great. 
Then I ran and started running into adversity. Then the devil started to come after me. I said, wait a minute, I thought I was coasting here. Oh, it's a war. Oh, I get it now. Yeah, oops. Oops. I repented. I said, I'll just go this way. I am a born-again Christian. I got taken out of the trash can of life by mercy and placed on a rock, a high rock. And I mean, I got saved, and my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Can you believe that? Somebody like me got their name in that book? Wow, that's incredible. I should have been washed up, dumped in a tank of hellfire. That's what I deserved. I got my name, and then I changed my attitude about it. Mark 16, these signs, Greek word simian, means miracles. These miracles shall follow those who believe. Pistuo. I went over that Greek word iteo for ask, remember that? And saw it was an exceptional term with an exceptional meaning. We got to do it here too. <clears throat> We've done this before. Pistuo is a Greek verb, present tense. It means to step out on your faith. Faith without works is dead. I have faith. What good is it? None. If I step out of my faith, then it activates the miracle. Simeon. You have to do something to get the Holy Ghost to move. These signs will follow those who step out and do something. Did a light bulb go off? I hope it did. That's why you haven't been healed and you haven't been delivered. You're not doing something. These signs follow only people who step out on their faith and do it. Can I think about it and pray about it? Please do that and then step out and do something. If you stop there, what do you get? <laughs> Back to Arabic. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> they follow only those who step out on their faith. In my name they shall. Why was that the first one listed? Not sure, but I noticed that years ago when I read that. It was the first one listed. They will speak with new tongues. That was the second one. Third one, I roll. They will pick up and get rid of serpents. I think that's a reference to spirits again. And it says, if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. In my mind, that was somebody trying to murder you for the gospel. Uh, could be something else. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall re recover. And they lay hands on the sick. Pistuo, they're doing something, right? You're stepping out of your faith and you're praying for the sick there. In some cases, they anointed them with oil. We had a healing line in Lagos one time. This was an outdoor service. <clears throat> there was about boy, 200 people there. A bunch of people lined up to get the Holy Ghost, and the pastors came out and gave us uh, big bottles of, of oil. Big bottles like that. And uh, I always, I learned to uh, ration the oil. So I would only take, you know, just like Americans, they don't like, a bunch of oil smeared all over them. This is America. So I'm taking 
this guy's oil, and I'm taking out a little dab will do ya. Remember that Brill Cream ad? You probably don't. That was popular when I was a kid 60 years ago, but I was taken out, and the pastor goes, hey, what are you doing? I'm anointing him with oil. No, no, no. He grabs a bottle out, pours it over their forehead. It's dripping down. Guy smiling. The little dabble, do you? That don't work in Africa. <laughs> I am a culturally appropriate minister. So then I start doing it. Okay? I pour it on like that. They'd smile. They were happy. They were getting anointed with oil. And then I'd grab their forehead, and then if this person started manifesting demons while I had my hand there, I would toss him over here and there was a bunch of ministers who would cast the demons out of him. Then I'd go to the next one, grab the oil, <laughs> hose him down, grab him. If that one didn't manifest, I'd pray a blessing over him. Next, next. <laughs> He'd start manifesting. I'd toss him to the wolves. They'd blow the demons out of him. I'd go to the next one. They were clear down there. I went through two bottles of oil. It's expensive. Uh, I just used a little dab here tonight for you. I just dip it up there. I'm not going to squirt you with it. Okay. But here's the deal. It's the oil doesn't heal. It's a symbol of the Spirit of God. He does all the healing. But they just, that was their custom. So whatever the custom was, that's what I'm going to do because I don't want to offend anybody. As soon as you offend somebody, then they're not receptive to getting healed. They think you're a kook or something. I have no idea how they thought that. They will lay hands on the sick, the stool. You got to step out and do it. Let's get ready to close. Uh, this territorial warfare stuff is illustrated in this weird uh, cartoon here. While I was in Athens, Paul said, the idolatry in that city provoked my spirit. So I identified the strong man over Athens, and I bound him. And then I released the spirit of truth into the atmosphere. When Silas and Timothy arrived, they blew their shofars, which activated the revival angels and consolidated the breakthrough. Okay, that's a joke, but the territorial stuff is silly. Everything is just right down here. It's just like regular people. We're just regular folks using our faith, our childlike faith, and believing God to do something wonderful down here. See? I mean, we're not going to sit here and pray against the fallen angels running New Jersey. First of all, in New Jersey, the angel, fallen angels are too strong there. <laughs> you got to stay out of New Jersey. But this is where we're, this is our war. Right here. And if they show up, the Holy Ghost takes care of that. That's what happened to Daniel. He had a big old war in heaven. He didn't know anything about it. He did not have a clue. Until the other angel told him, hey, I had this war I had to get through to get to you. And the same thing with you. You're taken care of. You're watched. Somebody's watching out for you. <laughs> you have the power of binding and loosing, but only down here. <laughs> Guess I should have chosen a different topic. <laughs> anyway. Whatever you bind on this earth has already been bound in heaven. Okay, So it has to be something within God's will. You can't just indiscriminately bind things. I bind the prices of these shoes at Walmart. Okay, you can't do that. That's not what it's talking about. 
those the prices on those shoes were not already bound in heaven. That that that's not working that way, is it? No. Let's take a question and then we'll quit. Any question in this group? Yeah, ma'am. Well, praying for people, uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah, I'll answer that. Answer that this way. I went to the Pensacola revival years ago. What was that? Ninety six. Yeah, so around ninety six. I can't remember the year. And uh, on Saturdays, they had intercessory prayer uh, night. Saturdays, they didn't have services. And so and on Sunday, they had a regular Sunday morning service. The rest of the week, they had those revival services. They, they were spectacular. So I go to the Saturday service, and uh, there was hundreds of people there. It was, it was awesome. Well, some guy got up on the platform who was the, uh, some kind of a leader for the intercessory prayer group, and he uh, started praying real loud and powerful. The guy was, was awesome. And he had the mic, and he was saying, you know, Lord Jesus, uh, please go to the east and save the people, Lord, and bring them here for healing and deliverance, and touch them, Lord. Go to the west, and he would scream this way, heal these people, Lord, bring them to repentance, send them the Holy Ghost. And that's how you do it. He didn't do this. I bind every territorial demon in P South Pensacola. I command those angels to. He didn't do any of that. See? You can do territorial warfare if you're praying for the people. See that? That's a prayer that will get answered. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Like just like Paul, that gal was coming after him, butting into his business. So it was a personal attack, boss coming at you. That'll work. Just like she said, it's not permanent, but that situation can be bound. Yeah. <laughs> so we found your, your ministry. We were uh, listening to an older gentleman that prayed with us. He was a good older Mr. Sumner, and, and Mark Hayes, and Mark Rodriguez. And, and it was their contention that uh, all disease and sickness comes from Satan. All sickness and disease come from Satan. Well, if it doesn't come from him, it's exacerbated by him. You know, uh, you can. You can do self sickness, okay? My my poor mother died at uh, sixty two from smoker's emphysema. Okay. Now, did the devil cause that? Well, no, but he influenced her through her anxieties and so on, and her physical addiction to nicotine to keep smoking. She had a weak constitution, so she couldn't quit. When she started to quit, she would have panic and got fidgety and had withdrawals and so on. So the devil didn't give her emphysema. She gave it to herself, but he, he exacerbated it. Some diseases are outright caused by spirits. Cancer, demons, get in your body, boom. They give you cancer. So, is, so how you would know is that you would the person doing the praying would have the discernment to know for what is the cause of somebody's illness. Well, yeah, uh, you you'd have to have discernment, or you could be like a counselor and uh, investigate the person's life 
and look for openings on how a spirit could have got in, such as drugs, alcohol, sexual abuse, whatever it is, opening door, and then then you could watch the sickness develop after that. Or if you don't know any of that, you can come against it. And why not try both? I mean, if you don't know anything and can't figure out nothing, why give up? Uh, assume it's a demon. If it's not a demon, then they need to be healed. Right? Or you can have outright discern discernment and know exactly what's going on. You know, not everybody has all the gifts, so there's other ways to help people if you don't have this gift or that gift. You know, your experience, your knowledge, your trial, your error, different things. And you can figure out in a way sometimes how to help somebody, and the Lord will help you figure it out with you. That's happened to me several thousand times over the years. I didn't know what to do or where to go with a person. And things just kind of fell out, fell into place. It was weird. Glorious. So, just because you don't know everything, you don't give up. You just keep going. And see if you can work that thing out. Okay. Yeah. Appropriate it. What do you mean? Hey, you put it on. Well, you, you go through God's word, okay, and you put on the helmet of salvation. You got to get born again, right? And you got to renew your mind on the word of God. So you have to do that. You have to receive Christ. You have to repent of your sin. You must be, be born again, John chapter 3, right? Then you have to renew your mind. Helmet, helmet sits on your head. And you do that through God's word, through prayer. You'd have to do that. God's not going to do it for you. Right? Yeah. You got to pick up the sword of the spirit. You have to become familiar with God's word. You got to practice through trial and error, success and failure. You got to learn to fight with the word of God and not your own abilities. And you work through it, making mistakes, winning, Losing, doing well, screwing up, and you learn to use the armor of God. Okay? You put on the breastplate of righteousness. Hey, you got to become a sanctified person. You got to change your life. How you think, who you hang out with, what you do, how you talk. Huh? Yeah. But it says you put on the whole armor of God. You got to do it. God's not going to do it for you. He'll do everything what He does, and then He expects you to do everything you're supposed to do. But He won't do what you're supposed to do, and you can't do what He does. Partnership. The word what? Logos? Yeah, that's John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and it was God. Right? Yeah. Well, Logos is the whole batch of God's word. A rhema is a part of it. So, uh, if I'm going to use a rhema word for deliverance, or I might use a rhema word for healing, okay? but I'm taking the rhema word out of the logos. Christ is the word of God, the whole word of God. Logos. 
and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall, that's a rhema word. Come out, spirit. The rhema is that. The logos is that. The boulder is that. And you're a chip off the boulder of Petrus. The Petra is Christ. The logos is Christ. All of God's word. Everything Jehovah has, he has. But a rhema word is could be different. One for you, one for you, 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 you. And it could be different for each one. That's what that means. Well, what she's asking me is, do you use a specific word <laughs> that relates to the specific problem, or do you, do you use a general word? Okay, remember, the Word of God without faith doesn't do anybody any good. Okay? The same word you read, Mormons read. The Jehovah Witnesses read. Okay? You may be a legalistic person in your church with religious demons floating around in your brain, and you're quoting the Bible to everybody in the world, but your life is a tattered piece of garbage. Okay? The Word of God only works when it's anointed. The only way for it to be anointed is if somebody applies their faith to it. Then it becomes unstoppable. That's why Bible thumpers are so useless. That's why Bible scholars are never at the altar healing anybody. They have a huge intellectual, intellectual concept of the word, but no spiritual practicality. So if you know John 3.16, eight different languages, who cares? What you want is someone to get born in the Spirit. Anybody can quote the Word of God. It won't work unless it's in, it has an ingredient and it works best with childlike faith. Oh, is that what God said? Okay. That's childlike faith. Scholarly faith is useless. Did God say that? Let me think about that for a second. Now, how does that relate to... Have you got a strong concordance on you? Do you have something stupid? You just receive it like a kid and you just go with it. Go with it. That's how you get miracles. Amen. Let's pray.